Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we'll talk with Michael Covell of TrendFollowing.com. We'll talk about trends that speculators are following today and see what Michael thinks of the current market environment. In the mailbag today, lots of questions. Gold, Bitcoin, insurance stocks, the price to sales ratio, all kinds of stuff. And remember, you can call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my opening rant this week, I just want to share a really wonderful article with you that I read in the Financial Times. And once you find out what it's about, you'll know why I'm sharing it. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. So what's this article that gets a whole rant? I mean, a whole rant on one article in the Financial Times? Wow. So th the one article is by, I think, one of their best writers, Robin Wigglesworth. And it's called The Tesla Financial Complex, How Carmaker Gained Influence Over the Markets. And it's all about how huge of a footprint Tesla makes in the financial markets. And... I wrote about this recently in the uh, in, in a recent Stansberry Digest. We have a daily digest for all our paying customers. It's just something they get free whenever they sign up for any of our products. And I do it every Friday, and lately I've been doing it on Tuesdays. But that uh, I'll stop doing that um, after the first of the year. Anyway, so I read something in here. I knew Tesla was making it. Had a big footprint in the market. I knew it because I've seen other data points just sort of tweeted out and things here and there. But I just had no appreciation for it until I read some of the statistics that Robin Wigglesworth put in this article. So here's one. He says, and, and a lot of this is driven by options. I've written about this in the Stansberry Digest too. The options market is like, we think of it as this thing beside the stock market, but it's lately it's like the tail wagging the dog because of the dynamic in the options market where people buy tons of call options and the and the the firms the financial firms that sell these the options dealers they've sold them so they're short and they have to go into the market and hedge that position by buying stock in that in that same stock that they've sold the options on so their their clients are long and in order to get neutral again, they have to go long and it's like rocket fuel and it just goes around and around because their buying prompts more buying and uh, of call options and then the call option buying prompts more hedging buying and it's just this upward spiral. And that dynamic has been at play in things like, you know, the short squeezes that that sent the meme stocks, GameStop and, and AMC theaters, just soaring out of sight in just a couple of days, you know, hundreds of percent in a couple of days. Well, this option activity is behind that, and it's been behind the soaring performance of Tesla and the dominance of Tesla. So here's, here's one quote from this article. He says, the Tesla options market, more than 60 times as active as the entire FTSE, that's like the European... 100 options market and almost seven times greater than the euro stocks 50 options those are big european stock indexes has helped push u.s option trading volumes above actual stock trading volumes this year that's unusual then he says in november options trading was 50 percent higher this is you know obviously this article came out like very recently, like November 22nd. But so, you know, it's like, so, so what he's saying is so far in November, options trading volume was 50% higher than stock trading in nominal terms. 
And without Tesla and Amazon, it would have been 20% lower, according to Goldman Sachs. Did you get that? Total options trading was 50% higher. Without Tesla and Amazon, it would have been 20% lower. That's how much options trading activity we're talking about. And this one guy estimates historically combined trading activity in U.S. equity options has been between 10 and 20 times larger than activity in the biggest individual equity options market. So there and there's like there's a there's a half dozen of these crazy statistics that he cites throughout this article. And it's just you, you have to wonder, like all of this option volume, you know, people are speculating on short term call options. I've seen other data that says people overwhelmingly favor the shorter term call options, which is more and more speculative and less and less about hedging. Right, you're you're not hedging an equity portfolio if you're buying a one week option, right? You're speculating, so it, it's just part of what is happening now. It's part of the insane speculative frenzy that we are living through. This is this is what it feels like. I can't call the top. I can't call the bottom. Can't tell you when to sell it all and run away and make a million dollars shorting stocks. Nobody can tell you that, but. I can tell you what it feels like because I'm 60 years old and I've been through it multiple times. And it feels like this. It looks like this. I mean, Tesla's got a $1.1 trillion market cap. It's more than the next 12 mostly profitable car companies combined. And Tesla doesn't really make a profit. You know, their their big profit was from selling these you know, regulatory credits and one of their big customers for buying them disappeared. So their profits can evaporated. You know, it's not a great business. The car business itself is not great. So, you know, Tesla has just it, in every big mania, there's one stock that captures everyone's attention. In the 1929 mania, it was Radio Corporation of America. That thing was like it was something like a hundred bagger. And then at the end, it finished up like, you know, not even double the price it started out with. So, you know, all it was a total round trip. You know, it went from like a dollar to three hundred dollars or something like that. And then back to like a dollar fifty or something, you know, <laughs> it just got completely obliterated. And and um, same thing happened with Cisco. Right. Cisco was like Cisco Systems, the ticker symbol, you know, CSEO. That stock was sort of the number one no-brainer of the dot-com era. Like, no matter what else you were into, you couldn't go wrong with that. It was in 10 of the top 10 mutual funds. Barron's wrote this article that said you can't go wrong, like very near the top. You know, you can't go wrong owning Cisco, right? And and it was, you know, it, it soared out of sight. I mean, I think it went pub public... Well, split adjusted, if you go back, I'm just eyeballing a, a Bloomberg chart. March of 1990, it says it was eight cents a share. And at the top, I know that it was close to $80 a share. It was, you know, it's it, it's a hundred bagger, right? Or I'm sorry, a thousand bagger, right? So a hundred bagger would have been eight bucks from eight cents. So a thousand bagger, right? And then it crashed like from basically from 80 to 8 it was like minus 90%. So yeah, I guess if you bought it at the IPO you were still way the hell out. You're still a 100 bagger at the bottom, but let's face it, tops happen because everybody gets in at the top, right? No, you know, nobody got in at the beginning and stayed there. Everybody got in at the top and and a lot of people lost a lot of money and it's still it's still is not back to its dot com era high. The stock's like 55, the high was 80, still not back there yet, right? That's what can happen when you buy stocks near the top. And, and that has been John Hussman's thing for the whole, for, for some years now. He says, you know, the, the, the returns from this moment, historically speaking, in terms of valuation, have been flat or negative. And that's where we are. There's always one stock that really 
It's the quintessential bubble stock, and I think Tesla is probably that stock for this era, right? It's the Radio Corporation of America or the Cisco Systems. And your only rational expectation, if you're paying these prices, a thousand dollars a share, a trillion dollar market cap, is <laughs> to lose a lot of money real quick. So that's where we are. Tesla is in charge. Tesla's practically it's in charge of the options market, and it's you know it's practically in charge of the stock market. It's like everybody believes this is the absolute no-brainer bet. And when everybody believes that, even if it's a great business like Cisco, a cash-gushing market dominator, which Tesla is not, it still could turn out really, really, really bad. And I think it's high. If you buy Tesla at current prices, it's highly likely to turn out really, really bad. That's all I want to say about that. Let's talk with Michael Covell and see what he thinks of what's going on in the markets these days. Let's do it right now. Today, I want to bring up Matt McCall's exclusive interview. He recently filmed this for Everyday Investors. And since I'm the host of Investor Hour Radio, I want you to learn more about Matt and what his presentation is all about. Matt has decided to step forward with some much needed clarity on the markets and a huge prediction about the stock market that most media outlets are completely overlooking. As the world goes crazy for speculations, thousands are turning to Matt McCall for his latest thoughts. As usual, his prediction is not what you'd expect. Matt says, there's a big lie infiltrating the mainstream financial media right now, and I'm hell-bent on exposing it. Matt believes we're at a pivotal moment in financial history where fortunes will be made and lost. But the right story about exactly how to make money in the stock market today is not being told. So to get the story out, Matt McCall went in front of a live audience to reveal likely the best way to make money in America right now and exactly how to position yourself properly. During the presentation, you also get the name of the number one stock Matt McCall says to buy right now. The last time he gave away a free recommendation like this, it soared over 300%, so you want to pay attention. To watch the exclusive interview free for a limited time only, visit www.messagefromdan.com. The website again is messagefromdan.com. All right, it's time for our interview. Today's guest is Michael Covell of trendfollowing.com. Covell is the author of five, count them, five books, including the international bestseller Trend Following and his investigative narrative, Turtle Trader. Covell posts on Twitter, publishes his blog, and records a podcast weekly. His clients are in 70 plus countries, and he splits his time across USA and Asia. Michael also admires The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, collects dinosaur skulls, took a constitutional case before the Virginia Supreme Court, likes the Anthony Bourdain travel life, can still swing a bat with authority, and once ran for political office. Renaissance man Michael Covell, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. You're a busy guy. I am. And I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm just coming out of jet lag coming from uh, Asia for the last 2.5 years to the States. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm getting my sea legs under me. Yeah, I'll tell you, when you fly back and forth across the country, it's one thing. But, uh, you know, you come from Asia and you can have a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Time, time, the great destroyer, the great healer. Uh, so I'm going to jump in because we, we've had you on the show before, of course. Um, so if anybody wants to hear, you know, we, we've talked about backstory and things and how you got started. But um, I want to jump into the deep end of the pool. Like the reason I, I felt like I had to, I'm like, I have to have Covell in the program again because – He's the trend following guy, and it sure seems to be like a lot of people 
are are following. They're following into huge speculative bets nowadays. They're following each other into massive call option volumes. There's a lot of, it looks to me like there's a lot of following going on, but I thought I should ask the guy who really knows about this. Well, how does the world look to you right now? Am I, am I right? I think you got it on the mark. I mean, it's not the kind of following in my trend following world. This is more like uh, bubble mania lemmings off the cliff following. Now, of course, I'm not really a fundamental guy, but you know, when I look at some of these value pros out there, the Jeremy Grantham's, the John Hussman's. Okay, people have their their beliefs about these guys, but you know what? They're pretty solid value guys. And when they start throwing these metrics up, that we are in the wild, wild west of speculative mania, I mean, they'll they'll say we're past dot com stage, which on a gut level feel, I kind of feel like we are too. But you know, from a trend following perspective, I'm kind of like, hey, look, as the ball as long as the bubble is rolling whatever market you're in you know you ride the trend however there's the side of me that even though i don't use the information from a hussman or a grantham there is a, a level of respect for their wisdom when they start to look at these metrics and when they're looking at value metrics and saying we're off the charts we're past the 29 crash we're past the dot com crash and we're off we're off into looney land and then on my own personal level, when I talk to people that have got millions and millions of dollars, some of them in open profit, and they're not worried at all, yeah, this 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 has got a this has got an odd feeling to it, and I'm sure you feel the same way. Oh, oh, Michael! If, if anybody listens to me for ten minutes, knows that I am way in the Grantham Hussman camp. Uh, I quote those two. I quote Hussman all the time. Quote Grantham all the time. Um, and and Certainly, like we have a question I'll, that I'll read in in the mailbag later in the show today about the metrics that some of these folks look look at. Um, in particular, one of Hussman's five earnings related metrics is is actually price to sales, not price to earnings. And you know he he knows the whole history of it, and it has correlated like negatively 90% with the S and P 500. So when it's way high, the subsequent returns are way low. And people are asking, well, maybe these metrics don't work anymore, you know, and and you, I think, you know, to some extent, to at least some extent, you have to believe it's different this time. Right. And it never is like the metrics might change, but human nature never changes. Right. We're animals. We are complete animals. And right 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 now, uh, it, it, you know, speculative mania. I mean, everybody is getting rich. And when everybody's getting rich, there's often a moment where everybody stops getting rich. It's really that simple, isn't it? I think so. I think so. And it's um, as much like what I keep telling listeners and readers is that I'm not going to call the top and, and look at a particular metric and say, this is it. You know, it's all downhill from here. But what I can do, I think, is, you know, since I've got some gray hair, I just turned 60. I can tell you what it feels like because I've been at the top multiple times before. So this this feels, and I think you'll agree with me, this feels as toppy as it's ever felt, in, in, certainly in our lifetimes, right? It, it, it sort of feels insane. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, it, it feels like we've come unmoored, really. There, there, it's, it's completely uh, off the hook. And, and you don't, you know, for me, spending a lot of time outside the States, of course, I'm in the markets, looking at the markets, all that kind of stuff. But when you come back here to America and you start to feel this, this energy, you know, you go to something like Tyson's Corner Mall and everybody has this gait in their step where they feel like they are a billionaire. And, and it, for me personally, it reminds me of the dot-com era. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny, Michael. Do you remember, I don't, I don't know if you remember this. There was a bumper sticker that got a little bit of uh, airtime during the dot com bust, and it said something like, "Please God, just one more bubble." And it looks like they got their wish. Well, you know what, what's really interesting for the audience to think about too is that, you know, when we had that dot com bubble, okay, things crashed out, bottom bottomed out in the fall of two thousand two. Then everyone knows what happened after the fall of 2002 because everyone watched the movie The Big Short, right? 
So everyone knows what happened until 2008. But like, it's almost like we've kind of turned off everything and no one's thought about what's happened after the big short movie, right? You know, so there's like, there's a 13 year window where it's like, oh, we, we watched the big short, we know what happened, but what happened after the big short? Oh, don't mind that, we're all getting rich right now. Yeah. That's right. It doesn't matter because we, there's another one right behind it, right? Don't worry about that last bubble that just blew up. There's one right behind it. Yeah. And, and look, you made, you made the point, though, too. It's not about, for me, it's not about from a trend following perspective. I'm not trying to time the top. But again, when some of these value pros, not my world, but when some of these value pros start to lay out some of the quant metrics on the value side of things, it does you know, it does perk up my ears a touch, you know, you're kind of like, okay, you know, even though I've got my stops, even though I'm following the trend, so to speak, when some when a group of people from an entirely different style of investing start to lay out those metrics, and then when you start to see on the ground, the behavior of people, and when you start to when you start to see all the people that really have no technique at all, but an absolute ton of open profits, that's that's when you start to have these memories of like, oh, you know, this reminds me of something. Yeah, it does. Um, but I'm glad that we're talking about this um, and that you mentioned that, you know, the the value metrics and things, because let's face it, the 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 advantage of the approach that you have championed for many years is that you you can forget about everything except for the price action and and whatever. You know, however you follow price action, um, and you can forget about everything except for that, you know, because it works. And yet, the trend following guy is sitting here telling me that he can't. You're, you, what I hear, Michael, is that you you can't look away from those extremes. You can't look away from those extremes of fundamentals that are worrying people like Hussman and Grantham. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I don't have it as part of my model, but you can't help but not see that. You can't help but see their expertise. And especially just on a basic human level, when you're looking at, looking at a, a, you know, a 13-year run, and we all know what happened after the big short. I mean, the Fed swooped in and did all kinds of, you know, gerrymandering, so to speak, and other regulatory agencies changed other rules, and we've had a great run. Now, the question is, and what I, I pose people is, do you ever ponder the possibility of 50% of your net worth just disappearing and not coming back? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, um, you know, it's as, as we, you know, sit here uh, talking around Thanksgiving, um, it's, it's like the Thanksgiving turkey. Like, do you ever consider that scenario where you're getting fatter and happier every day? You think you got the greatest life you could ever have. And then, you know, you wake up and your head gets cut off. Uh, people just don't, they're, they're totally unprepared when a bubble turns and becomes a bust. But, but not trend followers, right? They're always prepared because they use stops. So it's, so I, to some degree, I can understand the sort of, uh, you know, the more laid back feeling that you've described among some of these traders, right? They should feel that way, right? Yeah, well, I think if people don't really have a strategy and they're just in index funds or they're playing in crypto and everything is going straight up and they have zero strategy, like no planned exit. Like, I don't really think anybody should ever be in the market unless they know when they're going to get out before they get in. Like, you know, if you're going to get in, have a reason to get out before you get in. It seems like a very common sense way of thinking, but most people don't approach it that way. They hear something from the news or the media, their neighbor, whatever. They jump in and then if they get profits, all of a sudden they're an expert. They think they've done something. And I'm not trying to be all that. I'm not trying to say I know all that. But if you don't have a, an exit point, an uncle point in an environment like this, I, again, back to my 50% question, are you okay losing 50% of your net worth? And look, it could, you know, if we have another one of these meltdowns and we've had them, the NASDAQ bottomed, bottomed out at minus 77% in the fall of 02. Now, can the vast majority of Americans after a 13 year run bull, can they accept minus 77% 
as a, as a possibility even? I don't think so. Uh, well, certainly not the ones that are 21 years older, right? I mean, yeah. Well, those those poor kids, they're going to they're going to be uh I mean, you know, everyone knows right now the boomers got all the money, the young kids have basically nothing. I think that's one of the reasons they've jumped into crypto. Crypto is exciting and new and some young people went ahead and have made some early money and then their friends hear about it and everyone wants to jump in. And and look, I've no I'm not one of them, but I know plenty of people that have made millions upon millions off crypto and I salute them for taking that gamble. But Again, with any of these types of, I don't want to call them investments, but any of these types of speculative trades, you got to have an uncle point. You got to say, when I get in, what will cause me to get out? Right. And hopefully your uncle point is not at the bottom where everybody's uncle point tends to be, which is how bottoms are formed. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, that that's how it works, right? That I mean, that is the behavioral finance 101, right? No, Very few people that have, that don't have the exit strategy they're not going to, even when it starts to go down, because what's the human nature? The human nature is, well, hold on. Let's, okay, it's come down 10%. It's come down 20%. It's come down 30%. It's come down 40%. But if I just hold on, it will come back all the way to where I was. Yeah, that's, you know, that's one of the signs. When you hear somebody talking about getting even or getting whole again, and then I'll get out, that's sort of, oh, that's, that's cringeworthy, isn't it? It's just, that's how you know they're about to lose it all. Or a big, yeah. big portion of it all. How do you how do you feel about this right now? I mean, this is it. it, it you you share the perspective that it's kind of a wild and woolly right now. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super bearish. At, yet, like you, um, I mean, I keep finding well, as long as I find long ideas that are attractively priced, I can't not, you know, write about them and recommend them to my readers, and you know, buy them for myself when I find them. Um, so it's. Um, uh, it's just, I, I wind up being sort of, um, I'm, I'm long, you know, I, I don't think you should ever say you, as you've pointed out, you can't call tops and bottoms, you know, they call themselves impossible, impossible, right? So you have to keep with your strategy and my strategy includes holding plenty of cash, holding some gold and silver, a little Bitcoin, if you'd like, if you go that way, um, and and then just if you keep finding an attractive stock, you buy you buy an attractive stock. There's no reason not to, uh, because you won't be the one who calls the top. So I I wind up just being cautious and sort of like you. My strategy doesn't change, right? But I'm looking out the corner of my eye and I'm thinking this thing is going to fall apart at some point, and you better be ready for it. I'm constantly telling people, don't predict. You can't predict. Just prepare, right? You're, you're saying yeah. if you don't have a strategy, you're screwed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even if someone just takes a casual look, okay, yes, the uh, you know the Nasdaq, so to speak, is at its all time highs. But if you look at some of these high flying type tech stocks in the last two years, I mean, a lot of these are down anywhere from thirty to seventy five percent. So I mean, there's a there is a bear market underway, a huge one. I mean, you could argue some of these things have crashed, um, but. Uh, the Nasdaq is at the Nasdaq is at its all time high still. So it, th that's another little part of the, the the side metric for me that kind of raises the red flag. Right. So there are sort of sub bubbles popping. Right. Um, the Arc funds peaked in February. A bunch of stuff peaked in February. Uh, the Clean Energy Fund SPACs peaked in March or February, um, and a couple other things that I can't call immediately to mind. But Michael, what I keep thinking is well. This is, you know, this represents in a way the topping process that took something like two years. If you look at all the sectors of the S&P 500, they topped over a period of two years during the dot-com boom and bust. And, and now maybe we're getting the same thing. But on the other hand, who knows? Who knows, right? It could, it could, it get, the extremes of this could go up another hundred percent, like like nineteen ninety nine Nasdaq. You know, nineteen ninety nine Nasdaq was a hundred percent that year. So you, no one, I'm not sitting here trying to tell anybody to go take an exit right now. I'm saying, look, it's just you got to look at historical norms. You got to look at where we are, and at least. Uh, you know, kind of uh, hold your thumb up in the wind, so to speak, and kind of, you know, take a measure of where we are. Now, that's not telling that's not telling anybody to go out and sell everything. I'm saying, you know, you need a strategy. You, you need that you need that point of like, what gets me into a market? What gets me out of a market? How much am I going to bet on a market? What markets am I trading? 
these are just the basics. And I, I, I just have a gut level feel right now that a lot of people are not working with the basics. That, that is all. I think that's just always true. Too many people are not, do not have a strategy. They, they're brand new. They came in the last couple of years, like since COVID started and, and they're going to get wiped out. But we agree though. It's, we definitely agree though. You don't change your strategy and you, you, you have one to begin with and don't change it um, based on, you know, bearishness or worries about a highly speculative market. I think if, I think if anything today, you and I are both just trying to tell people like, okay, if you've been out there on the loose, so to speak, and you've really not had a strategy, maybe given to where we are on the all-time highs on equities, maybe it's worth just having a pause moment over the holidays and doing some assessment, you know, to, you know, picking up some picking up some reading material from some smart voices, doing something to where maybe you just want to not just keep trusting that uh, equities to the moon is a, is a guaranteed fait accompli, because it's not. <laughs> no, it certainly is not. I mean, over the very long term, 20 years, 30 years, um, we've certainly had sideways periods, but you have to buy at the peak to really get hurt by those sideways periods. And most people just kind of keep contributing and keep buying over a period of years. So you can actually buy, you know, if you're allocating carefully and slowly, you, you can just sort of average across a really miserable period and wind up doing really well at the end of it, right? You know, I find the one metric from Hussman really interesting where he lays out from his perspective, again, I'm not a value guy, I'm a trend following guy. So if we're at all time highs and we're going higher, I'm following along. Now, Hussman has a perspective where he says, from his perspective, that the valuation metrics have U.S. equities so overextended that if we were to stay at this level, you should expect, if you are a buy and hold investor, you should expect basically 0% return for the next 12 years. I think, I'm, I think I'm phrasing that correctly, how he says that, which I've always found a very interesting way of thinking about it. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen exactly like that because the markets can go up, they can go down. Um, but he's pointing out that's, that's a way to think about, from his perspective, how overvalued we are. Right. So I've been telling people, you can do one of two things. If you're dollar cost averaging into a 401k over time, you're going to contribute, you're going to buy the least number of shares at the top. And you're going to buy the most, you know, if this thing turns into a bust in two years, like the dot com boom and bust, then you're going to buy the most at the bottom and across that whole, you know, bottoming process. So, you know, you, you can continue to do that, but if you're an active investor and you're buying and selling and trading like all your clients are traders, then man, if you don't have stops in place, are you royally screwed? You absolutely must do it, right? And, and position sizing and stops. But what I want to know, Michael, is we, we agree on that. We know that. What I want to know is um, if any of your you know clients or you change anything if you get the conviction that say one of the big indexes, you've, you've cited the NASDAQ, if you're convinced the NASDAQ is in a huge downtrend, um, bear markets are brutal. It's really hard to make money short or long anywhere d throughout a bear market. And I wonder if the trend followers change anything if they conclude that the big indexes are in bear markets. Well, so this this would be confusing for some people listening because they might be saying, "Well, this guy Mike is talking about Grantham and Hussman. Sounds like a value sounds like a value guy." But listen, from a trend following perspective, I'm simply looking at the price, and that means everything that we're talking about doesn't factor in to the soup, so to speak. So it's really about you know from a trend following perspective, you're never going to get. The, the top, if, if we were just to talk about something like the, the NASDAQ uh, index, you're never going to get out at the top. You're going to get out after some, some period down from the top. So if you can imagine just a market going up and a market coming down, trend followers always get out, get out after the top. They don't ever time the top. So, you know, I think a lot of the things that we're talking about are really interesting just from kind of almost a, a, a personal gut level sentiment indicator that, you know, 
I mean, look, I remember back to the late 90s, you know, basically 97, 98, 99, you know, living in the northern Virginia area and, you know, watching all of these people that seemed almost like cartoon characters working in America online. And I thought to myself, th these people are not very bright. Um, they, they, their jobs are kind of silly. The whole thing is kind of silly. And, you know, then at some point in time we had, you know, ultimately the one of the biggest uh, meltdowns in the history of America. But, you know, I, I didn't trade off the fact that I was making these observations, but at least, you know, you, you, you can't help but notice them if you're human. You know, when, when some of the people you le least expect to be involved in money are talking about money, then, you know, it, it's, eh, it's sometimes time to pay attention. I'll give you an example. And this is not meant to sound uh, bad or anything, but the numbers of uh, ladies that have come to me asking if now is the time to buy Bitcoin when it's past 50 grand a Bitcoin, let me tell you, there's a lot of people out there that are throwing money uh, at crypto with no earthly idea what it is and no earthly idea what their plan is. Um, and, and so that, those kinds of things, when I see that, uh, that takes me back to the dot-com era. Now, it doesn't mean I'm trading off that. I'm not making decisions off that. But from a, senti from a sentiment perspective, uh, it's telling me something. Michael, do your clients mostly trade futures or stocks or options? Is there, is there one overwhelming type of you know, vehicle that your clients favor? No, there really isn't. I, I think traditionally trend followers started with futures. Uh, leveraged ETFs have worked well and uh, leaps options have worked well, the long term options that really don't leave you dealing with uh, uh, all of the Greeks, you know, no time decay and all that kind of stuff. Because from a trend following perspective, you're, you want to have a, a farther out view. So you really don't want to be caught up with if you're going to trade options, you don't want to be caught up with all the, all the Greeks and whatnot. That's that's I mean, that might be fine if that's someone's style. But from a trend following perspective, that's not what you're really after. Right. So Greeks are always a factor, but yeah, I guess you're saying if you go farther out, you sort of and get the trend right. It's more, yeah, it's more direction, more directional. For, yeah, you're so that, that's that's the that's the goal there. But I mean, I I generally will get people to say to look at either futures or leveraged ETFs because leveraged ETFs can still give you. There's there's quite a few ETFs out there that are actually comprised of futures contracts. So. You know, one thing we've not talked about in this conversation, we've talked about equities, but sometimes, and a lot of investors don't think about this, there are many markets out there that really are not correlated well with equities. So, and that's another reason that trend followers do really well. We haven't talked about that yet. Another reason that trend followers do really well during bubble times is because they are diversified across markets beyond equities. And I got to say too, you know, we haven't, again, like I just said, we haven't mentioned this, but when these bubble things happen, when these bottoms happen, I got to tell you, I've done the research, people can see it in my books, you know, whether you're talking about uh, uh, 73, 74, you're talking about the 87 stock crash, you're talking about uh, the dot com crash, you're talking about uh, 1998 with long term capital management, or you're talking about the big short period. All of those time periods, trend following is the absolute number one best performing strategy. It's not even a debate. So if if people are concerned about you know some of the things that we're talking about right now, trend following is definitely an option to keep in your holster uh, because you will you will avoid uh, if some of these terrible things that we're talking about do happen to happen. And again, I'm not predicting them. I'm just laying out sentiment. Uh, trend following is a great option. Yeah, so we've interviewed um, Jack Schwager, the Market Wizards guy, and of course he's interviewed like you know lots of trend-following traders and various kinds of traders over the years, including some of the original turtles and stuff. Um, and he was he was telling us actually he didn't say it. Uh, some of the folks that he interviewed in in one of his recent books were saying you know uh, the old sort of chart patterns really aren't working so great anymore. Well, trend following, trend following is not really about chart patterns. Yeah, I, mean, I know Jack. Jack's a really, he's a, a very accomplished author and he's interviewed a lot of great people and I've interviewed a lot of the same people. From a trend following perspective though, anyone that wants to make the case that trend following is dead or the classical trend following methods have not worked, my gosh, just look at the last two years, the amount of money made in trend following since 
COVID really started rearing its head in March of two, March of 2020. Until now, I mean, it's been an absolute gangbusters of Trent Pong performance in 2020 and 2021. I mean, off the charts performance, amazing performance. Right. So when you talk about trend following, you're talking about like quantitative, so-called quantitative hedge funds and things. I mean, well, I mean, I, I mean, just price action, price action, trend following the good old like, you know, something very simple. Hey, here's a momentum indicator, breakout moving average. Uh, you're taking a position. When you take that position, you have a stop. Um, you know what your position sizing is. And, you know, you're not going to bet the bet the farm on each trade and you're going to have a diversified portfolio of markets that you're looking at so it's not just for example tech stocks so that that's really the perspective but uh yeah you know it's it's a i've seen it over the years it's uh, people love to talk about trend following uh, dying uh but it, we're, we're definitely not there that's for sure trend following sounds like a really general term is it just one thing i mean i can't believe that all all those clients in 70 countries are all doing the same thing well it's it's a I would call it a general term. I mean, the way that I write about it, it's a very specific style of strategy that has been employed by numerous funds for decades. I mean, we're going on back to Richard Donchi in the 1950s. So it's it's been around for quite a while. Now, people might choose to have a slightly different entry indicator. They might decide to bet a little bit more or bet a little less, and that will affect their performance. But the bottom line is, is people are, you know, most people are not interested in trend following because they are those people that are out there right now, uh, long only with no, no exit, uh, just trusting the system. So most people, most people don't really want to go down the path of uh, where I exist and probably where you exist. That's right. That's right. It's, and most people are bored by this, aren't they? They're just like, wow, you really, you just want me to use the same position size on everything and only trade, you know, whatever it is, a 21 day breakout back in the day. And that's it. That's all I get to do. It's not very sexy, is it? Yeah, I think I think people people do want excitement. You know, they want to they want to pick the stock and they want to believe in it. And they, they want to have the story. Whereas I don't care about the story. I just want to make money. Right. But and and it's like it's almost like trend following is taking all the fun out of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, ser I, I'm sure some people could look at it like that. You know, I mean, it's a uh, Vegas. You know, if you want fun, go to Vegas. You know, don't don't use the market. It's like Covell's taking all the emotion out of it, but I was having fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I mean, seriously, I think Vegas is more fun than just gambling in stocks. But uh, so. yeah, you know, that Vegas line, you hear that a lot from from folks. Um, uh, in, well, you know, on your side and my side, they all they all focus on taking the emotion out of things. And it's kind of like, oh, really? So this is like work. You know, people don't want to do work. They want to have fun and make a ton of money real fast. You it know? is it, it's going to be interesting uh, to sit back and watch what happens here. Maybe we'll get some excitement over some real excitement over the holidays. Right. Before I head back to Asia in January. I'd love to see just some some real. Cr I mean, because you know, let's face it: when when things really go haywire in the equities markets, it is exciting. Now, people don't like it. A lot of people don't like it. Now, some people like it. Some people make a lot of money when that happens. So, uh, you know, the the grass is always greener, depending on what your strategy is. Sure, but but let's face it: when w the excitement we're talking about would be like a big move downward in equities, finally to blow off some of the steam. And uh, and that kind of excitement is, you know, it reminds me of I, I was watching one of the old uh, Indiana Jones movies. I think it was the first one when I first saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. It hit me as a younger man. I looked at the screen and I was like, oh, excitement is a lot of really unpleasantness suddenly in your life. I don't want excitement. <laughs> you know. So, yeah, I agree. All right, Michael. Um, we, we've actually been talking for a while. This has gone by like five minutes. We, we do, we, we, we do well. Uh, we will have to, we'll have to get another one of these, uh, on, on, we'll have to get you on my show here soon too. I know we were talking about doing both, but I'll, I'll definitely have you on too. Cause we, and I think this happened the last time we kind of just get on and next thing you know, uh, time rolls. Yeah. So what, I mean, I just want to ask you two more questions. I'll ask you my final question at the end, as I always do. But before that, um, I just want to know what what have you been up to? What what are you doing with yourself these days? I mean, is it uh, just sort of business as usual at trendfollowing.com or um, 
are you up to anything different or, or new and exciting? I don't have, I listen, the best way to say this is I'm a guy that lives in Asia. So I'm always got my hands in something. The big something I've got my hands in, I'm not ready to announce yet. But beyond that, beyond that, though, beyond that, if anybody would like to have the, the trend following expertise and reach out to me, I'm always I mean, that's been my life for for 20 plus years. So I'm always there. But, you know, when you when you're when you're living outside of the uh, the USA bubble, uh, there's always uh, motivations and influences that uh, that inspire. And I'm in the middle of those. Yeah, Asia is just the most hustling, bustling place I've ever been in the world. There's nothing like, I mean, and and it's a big continent and it's, and to say that about an entire continent is something, but I guess mostly like Southeast Asia, you know, Eastern, Southeastern China, even most hustling, bustling places I've ever been. You say the, you say the operative word, the operative word is hustle. And, uh, you know, it's it's infectious. It is so infectious. Can't let go of it. What would you tell somebody who like, you know, who said, eh, I've been thinking about moving, you know, somewhere else in the world outside the United States. Would you still be an advocate of heading, uh, you know, far east, young man? Well, I've been living in Saigon for the last eight years. So is that a good answer? <laughs> that speaks for itself, doesn't it? That is a pretty good answer. <laughs> All right. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, what what else could I say? There, the proof's in the pudding. All right. So I do want to ask you our our final question, which is the same for every guest in every interview, no matter what the topic. And uh, that final question is: If you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? To escape. Say that again. You were a little Skypey on that. The, the final thought that I would leave people with is the idea of escape. I don't think the great debates that exist in America can be solved. And I think living outside of America, I'm more accurately able to see that this is a never ending, almost like a game that the, the, the higher ups have put everybody into to have this kind of constant debate that we're going to get to some improvement and all that kind of stuff. I just say escape. Escape mentally, escape physically, but don't allow the system, so to speak, to wear you down. It's not worth it. The world is a big place, and there's absolutely no reason to stay preoccupied, for example, with U.S. cable news and USA politics. Uh, there's never going to be a victor. And if anything, the trend line uh, for where America is politically uh, is not a positive trend line. So, you know, I think people really need to say, well, and, and someone might say, well, that doesn't sound optimistic, Mike. Do I sound not optimistic? I'm not a pessimistic guy, but, you know, we, we they don't have life extension yet, right? So there's only a limited amount of time we have. So what are we going to do positive with our life? And I say escape mentally and physically, but leave it behind. Find something you love to do. Stop messing around. Stop trusting the system. Stop trusting the voices on TV. Do your own thing. That'd be my my single biggest piece of wisdom. Excellent. Thank you for that. Well, Michael, it's it's always a pleasure to speak with you um, and get your ideas and find out where your head's at at any given moment. And I promise you, we'll be doing it again at some point. Great stuff, Dan. I appreciate it. If anybody wants to find me, I'm easy to find at trendfollowing.com. All right. Thanks again, man. Hey, take care, Dan. Appreciate it. See you soon. Michael is one of those people that it's always good to talk to him because I just I just really need to check in with him and see where his head is. Because as you heard, he is devoted to, you know, a kind of very specific type of speculative trading where you watch your position sizes like a hawk and you trade a million markets and you use your stops and and that's it. Um, you know, and it doesn't the strategy doesn't change, but he's a human being and he's paying attention to more than just what he's doing. And, and I suspected that I, I sort of knew what he might say, but I had to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. And indeed he's feeling very cautious. He's feeling very sort of 1999, 2000 about what's happening today. And that doesn't surprise me, but I hope you enjoyed hearing from him as much as I did. All right, let's take a look at the mailbag. There's lots of stuff in it. Let's do it right now. Back in October, Mark Chaikin and I talked extensively here on the show 
about a special event he was hosting focusing on his power gauge system that we discussed? Well, he really wants you to have an opportunity to check out the system, and he's even giving away a free recommendation with it. According to Mark's power gauge software, the stock MIMECAST, M-I-M-E is the ticker symbol, could make you a lot of money. It's a little known company. If you act today, Mark says it could make you a lot of money. Now, if you've never heard of his power gauge system, um, it gives you the chance to double your money by predicting tomorrow's Wall Street stock ratings today in any kind of market. Last year alone, it pointed to Riot blockchain before it shot up 10,090% in 11 months. Digital Turbine before it shot up 789% in eight months. Overstock.com before it shot up 1,050% in four months and, and many more. It's been so successful, Mark once charged his former clients $5,000 a month just to see the output from the system. But today he's turning his back on all that. He's turning his back on Wall Street for the first time ever and sharing a way to claim free access to the system. Just go online to 2021tradingsystem.com. That website again is 2021tradingsystem.com. 2021tradingsystem.com. Check it out. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Send questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows and respond to as many as possible. Or call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. First of all, I must apologize because last week I read this email from somebody I thought was a listener named, his name was LL, let's just say. I don't want to give him too much credit. I think this is a bot. I think I've been had. It's not a Russian bot. It's not a Russian spam. But, but I think they got me because I noticed that this LL just writes these spammy, nasty emails every time. And it doesn't sound like a real person. So they got me. Sorry, I'll never do it again. First up for real emails from real listeners this week is Andrew W. And Andrew W. says, great podcast. Listening to Rick Rule never gets old. What a legend. And he has some questions here. Um, you have a lot of questions, Andrew, so I'm going to answer them in order as you ask them rather than read your whole email and then answer. So your first question is, how much of the lower gold price is offset by crypto demand? I don't know. It makes sense that some marginal amount of demand goes from gold to crypto, but I think conflating those two assets is foolish. I don't think that you know, crypto doesn't kill gold or replace gold in any meaningful way. Every smart person I read, uh, continuing on Andrew's next question, he says, every smart person I read seems to be moving some of their assets into Bitcoin. How much of gold's price not moving is due to smaller consumer demand oh, from jewelry for, from India and China due to less in-person gatherings and prices will resume when the economy reopens. Okay, so that has nothing to do with Bitcoin. That's just this idea that, um, you know, COVID lockdowns are preventing people from getting out and buying gold. Don't know, don't care. I don't worry about it at all. The idea that something is going to make people in India and China, like, buy less gold in their lifetime, I think is wrong. I don't think, I think those people love gold. And I think, you know, whether they get to buy it this week or this month or next month or next six months doesn't matter. They'll buy plenty of it. Another question Andrew has, he says, I have several of Stansberry's property and casualty insurance recommendations. How much of these companies' success was due to riding a 30 plus year bond bull market? Reinvesting the float will not get the same returns going forward. Do you expect we can see high single-digit compounding from this industry? Thanks, and keep up the great work, Andrew W. So, yeah, Andrew, I think you can expect to see excellent compounding from this industry, from the better stocks that we're talking about, for two reasons. The first reason is that the hallmark of these folks is that they're brilliant underwriters, and they make money underwriting. 
right? Lousy insurance companies either lose money underwriting or they break even or something, and then they try to make it up in the bond market or the stock market. So I don't like that. I like people who make money underwriting, and so does Stansberry in general. As far as how much of their company's success is due to writing a 30-year bond bull, I don't care because they generally hold these things in maturity and they're pretty good at picking them. So, you know, you could say inflation might hurt the returns a little because inflation will always hurt bond returns. So, so maybe they'll earn, you know, slightly lower returns on equity and, and returns on their investment portfolios in real terms. But I think overall they're going to perform pretty well and they can be expected to do so. Hope that provides a good answer. Thank you, Andrew. It's a good question. All right, next comes JH. And JH says, I hate to say this time is different, but do you really think you can compare the sales ratio of companies in the 60s using physical factories to manufacture actual goods with companies like Google and Facebook? I'm like you. I will never call them Alphabet and Meta, <laughs> who have databases and charge fees from other posters or advertisers. In the 2018 Berkshire shareholder letter, King Buffett explained why he is dropping the price-to-book ratio. I won't say that the PS ratio should hit the graveyard like the PB ratio, but don't you think it's a bit dated for you to remain so bearish? Thanks again for a great podcast and stay healthy, J.H. You know, J.H., certainly the price-to-sales ratio has correlated negatively with the S&P 500 90% of the time, but I feel like you could have said this any time in the past century, you know, um, you could have said it in the 60s. There were a lot of technology businesses there that were different than, you know, the railroads and manufacturers that came before them. And they were themselves manufacturing, but they, they were better businesses. So I, I, don't, I don't know if this is true. It's true to some extent, though, isn't it? Because a lot of the technology companies that are making up the big indexes that I'm talking about, the S&P 500 most notably, and saying that the price to sales metric works and it's way overextended, a lot of them do earn much higher returns on capital. They have much thicker margins. They gush free cash flow. They require hardly any capital investment at all, if any. They fund their business totally out of their own excess cash flow and have plenty left over after that. So it's a good question, but I do think it's still valid. Like, remember, price to sales peaked at like 2.3, I think it was, in March of 2000 and crashed along with everything else. Um, and it crashed again to below one during the, you know, the housing bust. And that was the peak at, at the peak of the dot com boom. And we had a lot of new technology businesses then. And, and now it's 35% above that peak. So sure, you can tell me the overall level will remain lower. And I tried to get some data on this, just grab it from Bloomberg real quick, but they only go back to like 1990, so it's not really enough. But, you know, each decade it's higher during that period. So what you're saying is true, but that's, you know, that's a function of, of a bull market too. So it's impossible to really, there's just not enough data there, right? So while you ask an excellent question, yeah, I do still think it's better. I think it's a lot better than price to book. And I think it does show that we are in a massive equity bubble. Will it bottom out below one next time? Well, maybe not. But, you know, it can go to 1.5 and get cut in half. So, you know, and what will happen to the sales of all those companies? Too. I mean, will they stay, you know, maybe maybe some of the damage will be mitigated by their sales not falling so, you know, as much. We'll see. We'll see. But forget all that. I, I do think it can get cut in half. And I do think that would be be a rational expectation in a bear market. I think it works. And you also said, P.S., I think it's time for John Hussman to come on the podcast. You quote him so much. Would love to hear him defend his positions. Well, he's defended his positions quite well in his own, on his own website and in, on his own Twitter feed. I've asked him several times. I probably won't be asking him again because I feel like it's rude. He's made it clear he doesn't want to come on the show. You know, it's all good. Next comes David S., and David S. just wants to say, I think the person Louis Rukeyser threw off his show for being bearish was Gail Dudak. I couldn't remember her name. Thank you, David. I actually looked it up in, in Maggie Mahar's book, Bull, and 
I read that whole chapter again. It's a great story. And I used it in the November 19th Stansberry Digest. But thank you. Coach Z has written in. He writes in now and then. Good to hear from you again, Coach. And he says, never miss a podcast. You have a believer here in your value thesis. I always question when to sell. Value is a relative condition. If a value stock becomes expensive or extended, do you normally trim, sell out of the position, or just let it ride? I find the sell side of the equation sometimes tricky. All the best. Would love to buy you a beer if I was ever up your way, Coach Z. Yeah, me too, Coach. I love beer. <laughs> you seem like a good guy. This is a good question. I can't give you an off the shelf, you know, one size fits all answer. All I can tell you is this. When you buy something that you think is dramatically undervalued, you have to decide whether it is, you know, a long term 20 year buy and hold great business that you expect to grow for decades to come. Or is it a highly cyclical stock, which many value plays are, that will have to be sold as the cycle turns and and the business you know begins to flourish again and the stock price recovers you do have to do that i have made the mistake of overstaying my welcome in cyclical value plays in the past so that's all i can tell you and you know whether you trim or sell out all at once that's up to you but you do have to figure out whether you're buying a cyclical or you just got lucky and you're buying a really great long-term play that got temporarily cheap alan w is next he says Nice session with Eric Wade. Thanks for that. A question for you, Eric. Several months ago, I was prepared to purchase Ethereum through Coinbase and quickly discovered that as a resident of Hawaii, I was not allowed to make the purchase online. Are you aware of this or know the reason for the state of Hawaii to not allow crypto purchases? While I realized that I could purchase through an account on the mainland, I'm curious whether you have heard of this or if other states have taken a similar stance. Keep up the great investor hour sessions. I rarely miss your program and appreciate your frank and honest responses. Regards, Alan W. Alan, I sent your question to Eric, and he says, he wrote back and says, that's a pretty common question because, yes, each state has its own rules for the exchanging of money for digital or virtual currencies. Among the most difficult are Hawaii, New York, and Washington. The alternative is over-the-counter, that is, peer-to-peer, -peer, or even mining coins, turning time and electricity into coins. or seeking out providers who have taken the time to file the paperwork necessary to deal with Hawaiians, such as Abra, Gemini, Kraken, or Swan. Again, Alan, that's Abra, Gemini, Kraken, or Swan. That's what Eric says. Good luck to you, sir. And thanks, Eric, for, for chiming in. Well, in the next question, I got our former guest, um, you know, geopolitical investing guru, Marco Papich, to comment. And the question is from Lodovic H. And Lodovic says, a geopolitical question. Yes, I'm from Europe, unfortunately. And he says, Lukashenko threatens to cut the gas supply to Europe. Well, the pipelines are managed by Gazprom. So if it happens, it would be in line with what Moscow wishes. Would this not be the move for Russia to get Nord Stream 2 operational? Construction is almost finished. Russia can simply say that they are redirecting, ruining the situation in Ukraine and Poland. Lodovic H. So I sent it to Marco, and he says, I went long ruble USD at the time. Given how much the USD is appreciated, the 3% return on that trade is kind of impressive. In my view, Russia is testing the new incoming leadership in Germany, Marco says. He continues, that is really the overarching issue here. The new SPD Green FDP government is being put under pressure. Moscow wants a recalibration of the relationship and is simply illustrating to Europe slash Berlin all the different ways in which it can create headaches. One, transportation of natural gas. Two, migrant transportation. Three, geopolitical tensions in the Donbass region of Ukraine. Moscow wants the new German government to resolve all these issues by, yes, as the client asks, approve the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, although note that German approval still has to go through the EU Commission as well. In addition, Moscow probably is angling for more than that. Russia has wanted a complete reset of relations with Europe, a sit-down tete-a-tete with the Europeans that excludes Americans so they can get more favorable deal from Europe. Cheers, Marco. 
Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Lodovic, for the question. That's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to InvestorHour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript, and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody who might enjoy listening to the show, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com. Do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop me a note, feedback at InvestorHour.com or call the listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.